Hi everyone, I'm your host Matt Salem and you've tuned in to another episode of Our Best Behavior, brought to you by Behaviorally. We are the global digital first leader in defining and diagnosing human behavior to help you achieve the most valuable moment in marketing when a purchase transaction occurs. We are Behaviorally, the transaction experts. Each month we share insights on trending topics within our industry and of interest to our customers. Today we're joined by Kat Borkowska, Insights Manager, and Nicole DeSimone, Insights Analyst here at Behaviorally, to discuss our complimentary ebook, The Power of Packaging to Drive Shopper Growth. So if you guys want a copy of this book, you can go right onto our website. It compiles over 50 years of best practice learning into a practical guide of creating effective packaging designs. So this year we actually launched a revised version of that book, which includes a packaging of e-commerce chapter. And we are delighted to speak about one of the particular chapters of this book today. So I have Kat here. I have Nicole here. I think I took too long to let you say hello. Why don't you guys (laughs) say hi, tell us a bit about yourselves, and then we'll get into the book a bit. Sure. Um, So hi, everyone. I'm Kat. Uh, I'm an insights manager here. I work on a bunch of different categories, have a lot of different experience in terms of packaging, different categories, and what clients do. So really excited to talk about it all. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Nicole. I'm an insights analyst. Um, My past experience here at Behavioral, I've worked also across various different categories that are vastly different. And my background is in psychology or neuroscience. So always diving into that behavioral science of everything. Yeah, you have a good mix between the two of us. We don't really overlap categories. So you have each end of the spectrum. (laughs) Love it. But the one thing that does overlap is the use of color in categories, right? That's what we're going to talk about always, right? And you know, that's one of the chapters of the book is called Color Color Codes of Conduct. And, you know, essentially what we wanted to kind of dive into today is the utilization of color mm-hmm. and how that impacts shopper behavior, shopper psychology, if you will, shopper experience. And, you know, when we think about color and various aspects of packaging and the, how they can impact the point of sale and shopper decision making, we have a common thread that we think about, the four S's, which is featured in the book. And that speaks to being seen, shoppable, seductive, and selected. And as we think about that framework, color really touches all of those four S's. So I don't know if there's any particular categories that you guys have seen where color may be more important in terms of being seen versus being selected, right? Maybe there's a category where there's mass ownership of a color. You know, think of Tide and orange for an example, right? And laundry detergent. When you think about color, what are some of the first things that come to mind as it ties to driving, being seen, being seductive, et cetera? Is it um, a particular category that comes to mind for you that you have experience in? Is it something personal? So I'll, I'll kick it to both of you to see what you got. I mean, for me, color always equals flavor. That's the first train of thought for me. If I see yellow, lemon, orange, orange, obvious one. Green could be like apple or sour, something like that. That's my first association all the time. So anything food related, the color has to match. If you're seeing something orange, it might be like a cheese flavor on a cracker, or it might be you know, some kind of lime flavor, citrusy, whatever. So that's my first train of thought. I don't know about you, Nicole. I think it's just in visual identity of brands, um, you know, brands tend to own color. When I go down the soft drink aisle and I see red, I know I'm getting Coca-Cola, you know? I know I'm what I'm getting right away. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you mentioned brands because one of my favorite ones that does color is Mountain Dew because they go wild with it. They don't really follow the law in any type of way <laughs> on any of their packaging. Like the default Mountain Dew is green, but they have all these wild flavors of like fire and ice or whatever and they just play with the color, they go crazy with it. Yeah, I I love some of the examples that you each brought up. I mean, first thinking about the flavor piece, what came to mind for me is how the context is so important, right? Mm -hmm. Because you were talking about green, and I was right there with you, thinking about apple and flavors such as that. But then my mind started drifting a bit, and I thought about, well, green can also mean spearmint or Mm -hmm. mint in the gum category, or more broadly, I think green ties to sustainability. So if you're thinking about color as a brand, I'm assuming that the context is also so important, and I'm sure any semiotician would agree. And and I'm wondering if there's been any interactions you've had with clients where they're really trying to investigate that color meaning specifically with shoppers. 
Yeah, I mean, we've we've definitely done some studies on that just to see how much does color matter? Does it matter? Does the flavor matter? What's being portrayed here? And it definitely matters on the category. So like you said, um, sustainability might be the big picture green, but if you start to zone in individually in the gum aisle, it's going to mean mint. If you go to um, maybe vegetables or like frozen food or whatever, it might mean organic something along those lines. So it definitely matters. It's really important to just find that balance of what does the color mean on the big picture, but then what does it mean in our category and how do we as a brand want to stand in that phase? Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Exactly. You also have to think about your audience. How is your audience going to take color? Are they people who care about sustainability and green is automatically going to create that association for them? Mm -hmm. Or are they flavor driven? Is it a flavor driven category? If you're going down the soft drink aisle and you see that bright neon green, you're thinking Mountain Dew, you know? Yep, yep, yeah, it signals for you in the category. And I think that's that's something else that I was hoping to touch on, which is are there other examples of brands that you've seen successfully leverage color to either create, you know, blocks or signposts in the aisle or effectively differentiate themselves from whether it's competitors or even their own offering, say it's a new product that they come out with, maybe they want to differentiate. So still kind of maintaining some of the core visual equity, but perhaps using color in a way that signifies it's also different from the rest of the portfolio. I mean, for me, it's tied. I know you mentioned it earlier on. Oh, but we're on the same page. Yeah, that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's what there is to it. First thing that comes to mind, if I'm going down the laundry aisle, I see orange, instantly think tied. Even like their white, packaging and bottles they all have that orange splash in them somehow yep. like that is automatically considered with that brand it is their color like i can't imagine anyone else going after orange in the laundry aisle yeah me neither <laughs> exactly the color of a pack really does create a beacon towards that brand but also i've seen brands really play with color to create that differentiation within the master brand so especially with laundry detergent. I mean, I'm an, a newly expecting mother, so I've been focusing on, you know, more natural, more gentle laundry detergent. So when I'm going down the aisle, I see a white pack, but then I see the logo is retained. So you know the white is associated with maybe less chemically, more natural. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna associate it with more gentle. So if you, I've seen brands really play nicely with color to retain the their main focal visual assets but then also create differentiation within the master brand yeah yeah i think i i've seen that too over the years and it's a color has always been an effective way to guide people to your brand but also to potentially either guide them in addition to that to the variants within or just indicate hey there's something new and different in our brand here. exactly and then you know this one has this benefit this one has this benefit and you're not getting as confused at shelf and it's much more easy to shop that brand. So on the heels of the detergent example, which I think we all rallied around, <laughs> are there any other examples that you've seen recently in the marketplace of brands doing color well, whether it's from a you know, kind of a master brand, brand block standpoint, or from a differentiation standpoint, or perhaps just something completely different that we haven't discussed yet? in terms of how the color is working to help shoppers. So I actually really passionate about this one because I think it's hilarious. I saw a meme once um, of a, a, like a girl just saying, I sent my boyfriend to buy me tampons and he texted me, what flavor do I get you? And <laughs> tampons are all different colors because it all depends on the intensity and the same thing with pads. Like they usually coincide just fem, fem care overall. Yep. Um, and I think that that category specifically, the packaging itself might not really be the same color because you have Yukotex that's black you have Playtex that's very pink, um, but the packaging inside of the actual tampons, they all match across the category. It doesn't matter if it's Tampax, doesn't matter if it's Playtex, doesn't matter if it's Kotex. They all have the same color for regular media or regular uh, strong, super like super strong, all of those. And I think that's really great. That for me as a consumer, as someone that buys the product, if I'm looking, I'm like, all right, I need the yellow ones. Find me the yellow ones. That's what I do. Ah, okay. So there's a commonality kind of across the different brands within the category to a degree if it comes to, say, absorbency. Mm -hmm. But the brands themselves on the outside obviously have their own look and feel. Absolutely. Because it's okay. one of those things that if you change it, if Playtex decides, oh, we're going to change regular from yellow to purple, 
you're going to confuse your consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I, I do have my fair share of experience in Femcare and Inco products over the years. So I, I can relate to the examples that you're giving. I think they're, they're great examples, actually, because it's utilizing color in two different ways. I mean, one is to differentiate yourselves from everybody else in terms of the brands, right? But the other is to create that that feeling of consistency and commonality and ensure that you feel like you're getting the right one for you when it comes to the packaging inside, the mm -hmm. secondary, if you will. Exactly, and yeah. that's that's important. Yeah, the secondary piece of importance, yeah, oh, okay. What mm -hmm. about you, Nicole? Did you have any examples of, you know, maybe you were in the store recently, something that caught your eye using color in a cool, unique, different way? I mean, I'll always go back to the skincare example. Um, for me, I'm very habitual in what I buy, so I know my night cream has blue on the pack, my day cream is more light, and I just know to gravitate towards that. And if my b favorite brands switched it up, I would be so confused in the, sh in the aisle. <laughs> I wouldn't even know what to do. <laughs> okay, okay, that's another good one. I guess night, day, and like the different day exactly. parts and how color can indicate. Okay, what's your favorite brand? Which is the one that you're using in the aisle? I'm using CeraVe. <laughs> okay, that's what I use on my uh, daily lotion. Look at us, my daily all three. Hand lotion. I also Here we do go it. again. I'm, I'm a CeraVe person. Yeah, I use the lightweight. <laughs> you know, it rubs in nice. There's no grease left on my hands. I mean, it's at my desk right now. You could test me when we get back. You'll see it's sitting right there. <laughs> so that's white and blue, that packaging too, I believe. Yes. Right? And that's, that's just how it works, right? I mean, it, it kind of does get ingrained in your mind. So even though in the aisle, what brings packaging to your attention and we've seen that you know roughly half of shoppers will see color first right mm -hmm. that's like the first thing they notice and even though color is something that needs to contrast to get your attention your brain does make an immediate association with it so it's important that brands respect color as a visual asset if a brand is thinking of making a revolutionary change arguably one of the things that should be kind of a guardrail and a watch out is well we can make a revolutionary change in ways that still keeps our color intact to some degree. Even going back to the Tide example, when it has a white bottle, it still has the bullseye and the mm -hmm. orange in it that you would expect, right? If it were to completely walk away from orange, you might just see white with your eyes and you know it might contrast, but it might not register and you might move on. And I think that linkage is important. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if we think about beverage, let's say, expectations that are set by color, you know, you brought up Mountain Dew, but we talked about the outside. What about the beverage itself? What about packaging? Oh my God, if it's seafood? colorful, it's artificial. A automatically, that's my thought. Unless okay. it's a juice, if it's any type of soft drink, the more color it has or the more wild the color, it's fake. So like, how does that relate to say health? It sounds like less healthy, more color might be an indicator of less healthy? Yeah, that's what I would do. If it's like any type of soda, any type of pop drink, fizzy, whatever, Okay. the more colorful it is, the more bright, the more neon, automatically the health like bar graph just decreases. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We, as people, our brains just love to make connections and associations. And with color, there's very much powerful connections created. With the color green, you're gonna take that to mean natural, sustainable. We see a lot of health supplements use a lot of green on pack, mm. and it's a category norm. So if you had a supplement brand that wanted to revolutionize their packaging and use colors that are outside that category, it might actually drive people away from picking that product up. Yeah, yeah, it has to be done with care. Absolutely. Always, you have to strike that balance, which is why <laughs> doing research on packaging is so important to validate any change. Yep, agreed. One thing that came up, maybe not explicitly just now, was the intensity of color that's used, if you will, or the saturation of color that's used. And I think that's another interesting piece to think about when it comes to the color codes of conduct, right? Because if you're, say, using that example and thinking about, say, juice, right? If you're a lighter red color, let's say cranberry juice, versus a really deeply saturated color of cranberry juice, forget health implications aside, it might have uh, impact on the perceived taste, right? A, a lesser mm -hmm. powerful taste versus a more powerful taste. So you know, I don't know if there's any examples that come to mind for you guys, but when I think about the saturation or the depth of color, particularly on beverages, it really does tie to that flavor expectation and not necessarily is it cherry versus is it pineapple, you know, red versus yellow. But if it is cherry, how deep that red is, is somewhat how intense that flavor is going to be for me, at least. I don't know if you guys would agree or if 
similar thoughts in mind. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. And I really like when the product does the packaging for you, where you see it through either a glass or a mm -hmm. plastic. It's just clear through. You see exactly what the product is. It just shows you exactly what you're getting. I love pickled foods. And a lot of the things I buy are in glass jars um, and they do the packaging for you. You see exactly the product, you see the color. Like if I buy pickled cabbage, I'm gonna see exactly how red that cabbage is and that's gonna indi indicate flavor to me. Like the redder it is, maybe it'd be, it's more, I don't know, pickled or whatever, longer process, whatever the science behind it is. <laughs> or it might just be a more mild thing. Same thing with like regular pickles, like not even cabbage, but like regular pickles, the, more, like the longer you do them, they change color. So it's that's also interesting. Ah, all right. You got to drop some knowledge on this now. No, I'm Pol <laughs> I'm Polish. I'm really passionate about pickling. Like I we, love we it. can have a whole conversation about I, just I pickling. Mean, <laughs> I got I think I got half sours, garlic pickles. I got butter, uh, bread and butter, whichever ones those are, like the mm. butter chip pickles in my fridge right now. I got Clausen's hot spears in my fridge right now. I mean, I can definitely talk shop with you there a little bit. <laughs> but you said you have a variety of pickled items. So I'm, yeah, no, it's it's a whole it's a science. It, it really is. I make mm. my own pickles. It's great. Now, let me ask you this then, thinking about the topic on hand, when you're shopping for pickled products, are you really relying fully on the see-through nature of the packaging and the product itself to tell you? I mean, what are some of the label category codes and color codes in pickled products? Are there any, or is that category a bit more amorphous? I look at everything. I'm very, I'm very skeptical of a lot of products just because I, like, the pickles in the U.S. stores are different than the pickles in like a Polish store or a Russian Ukrainian store. It's a different type of pickle. I'm very okay. passionate about this. And I will look at it be like, what brand is this? What are the seasonings? I will sometimes look at the ingredients to look what was added. Is there anything funky in there? Like I want my pickles to be natural. Is there a color code in the category? There is. It's going to be, I would say it's like white, blue, and green. Those three. And they're equaling? There, so there isn't really a specific equaling. White could just be used as a, a label so it's easier to read or cleaner to read. And then green and blue, just they work with what the product is. Okay. So pickling, mm -hmm. you know, when it changes color, there's the chemistry that happens, the fermentation process, whatever it is. It goes from the natural color of it. It turns a bit more yellow, which is kind of on the green side. And then blue just helps it stand out. Okay. All right. I like that. See, that's bringing it very close to home for you, right? Yeah. It's something that you're really passionate about, as you said, and you know, it's a food product that you love. So I, I wanted to see, well, what are those color associations? And you did quite quickly say white, blue, and green. And so yellow. There's something I, I there. forgot about yellow, but okay. yellow is a big one too. And that's just because the product is getting more yellow. <laughs> now you have to think, what if I walk down the pickle aisle and this new brand came out and they're they made their packaging pink. Their label was pink. It I would, would think it's like cabbage. For, exactly. It would <laughs> throw you for a loop. Yeah. You re really, there's definitely category norms. No, there is. Yep. Absolutely there are. Yep. But does that mean that you can't veer from those norms all the time? I mean, there's certainly some examples of packs. You know, we bought up uh, Femcare before. I mm -hmm. think You by Kotex is a famous example, right? They came out with the all black pack in the category. At the time, that was revolutionary in terms of a color being used as the main color in the category. So, you know, I guess the question is, we know that that was a success. And while we all can sit here and nod our heads in agreement that you have to respect the codes of a given category, of a given, you know, flavor kind of expectation, you know, let's call it apple is green, right? You're not going to mm -hmm. have an apple flavored product and then put it in maybe a pink pack. That might be a bit of a disconnect. Somebody might expect, you know, bubblegum, strawberry, whatever. How do you find that opportunity? Like, how does a brand uncover the opportunity versus the risk of introducing a color that isn't following the category cues or norms? Is it is it simple to do? I mean, like, can you just pick the color? Like you said, like, can you just go pick pink and, hey, we're the pink pickle company? Is it that simple? I don't know. No, I think it's definitely a challenge, and brands really need to be careful and make sure they're thinking about their audience, thinking about the associations that a new color would drive. Like think about the color black. What does that mean for people? It could mean premium. It could cue, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. You have to think about what it would really cue to shoppers and manage to implement it in such a way that you're still leveraging the assets that you already have. Mm -hmm. 
to reduce any friction for shoppers. Yeah. yeah. And it, I think it's also really category specific. I mean, in femcare, black could be seen as this more premium, more modern take on the product, and it works really well with pink mm -hmm. as well, which is what it works. But if you look something that like you're walking down the chip aisle and you see black, you might now think spicy. Like now that changes it because it's a different category. Black is no longer modern premium. Black is now, oh, is this going to be a spicy product? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And you came full circle there because we started the conversation a bit around the context and how color differs by context. And I think that's a great example, too. Um, you know, and further, the audience piece is interesting to me, right? Because I wholeheartedly agree. You have to know who you're targeting and who you want to talk to with your use of color. And sometimes it may be as simple as, hey, the general category buyer has these expectations and we want to abide by them. But if you're a new product or you're trying to embrace new positioning, then maybe you have some research that suggests, well, we're targeting Gen Z consumers and among that cohort of consumers, there's a particular color that we know is best at communicating premium or flavor or protection or safety or whatever the attribute may be. So I think that audience piece that you had raised is, is really important too. Well, it's been an awesome conversation on color I think I'd be remiss not to ask you each before we end this podcast what your favorite color is. <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of red. Always was, always will be. All right, red for cat. We got it. I'm going to say lime green. Oh, I like it that. It shifts Ooh. with my mood, but today it's lime green, I think. I like it. Does it shift shades of green or does it just completely shift to another color? It shifts. It shifts. To another color? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So you're red, you're lime green. I'm blue for what it's worth. Right. That's always been my favorite color. Um, I think it's very commonly associated with being a calm color. Mm -hmm. I'm not really a calm person, so there's a disconnect there, admittedly, <laughs> but it's my favorite color. Um, so Kat and Nicole, thank you very much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. I'm glad you were here with me. Um, I'd like to thank our audience for listening here to Our Best Behavior. Once again, this podcast has been brought to you by Behaviorly. Check it out, the Our Best Behavior podcast. There's other episodes there in the link. Again, thanks to Kat. Thanks to Nicole. Thank you to our guests for listening, and we'll catch you next time.